presentation looks at the stories behind some of the inmates of Cambridge Jail on Parker's Peace, recorded in the National Census of 1851. The Cambridge General Advertiser had reported on the 5th of January 1850 the case of Charles Collis, aged 31, and John Shadbolt, 21, both labourers, who were charged with stealing in Cambridge a great coat, property of one Alfred Baxter, tailor of Bury St Edmunds. Alfred Baxter had been at a house in Fitzroy Street the previous November. It was a brothel, kept by a Mrs Pryke. Mr Baxter handed over his coat, worth about 30 shillings, at around 3pm and went into the front parlour where the two Miss Gardeners were and Mrs Pryke's own daughter. Four hours later Mr Baxter emerged. His coat was gone. He eventually recovered it from PC Robinson the following Sunday. Mrs Pryke had seen the prisoner Charles Collis around the back kitchen of the house. He used to go on errands for her girls. The back of the house was known as Devil's Row. At 7pm, the coat was gone. Mrs Pryke saw Collis at about 8 and accused him of stealing it. Esther Gardner, described by the newspaper as a nymph of the parve, gave witness in court and said she saw Collis at the house and heard him say he took the coat. A Mark Levy stated to the court that he lived at the Castle pub in Butcher Row. He was a dealer in clothes and cigars. On the morning of the 25th of November, he saw the prisoner Shadbolt on Midsummer Common. Shadbolt offered him a coat which he bought for 15 shillings. In the evening, he was tracked down by PC Robinson and gave the coat over to him. The jury found Collis guilty of theft and Shadbolt guilty of receiving stolen goods. Collis had a previous conviction. Shadbolt was sentenced to two years hard labour, Collis to seven years transportation to Australia. On the 30th of March 1851, the date of the census, we find Charles Collis and John Shadbolt in Cambridge Jail. Did Collis ever get to Australia? He doesn't appear on any list of those actually transported. There are 41 other men and 14 women in the jail with them. What had they done? The jail on Parker's Peace had been built in 1827 at a cost of £25,000. It was in use until its demolition in 1879. In 1851, John Eads was the governor. He had been appointed in 1839 and kept a journal of his time in post, which survives. The contemporary newspapers throw light on many of the inmates. There were crimes of poaching. Four Buntingford labourers were found guilty of going after rabbits on the land of George Lilly. Sentence, one to two months, hard labour. Harry Whitehead and William Cannum had helped themselves to some pig's trotters off a street cellar. They were caught in King Street. They had a past record and the magistrates sent them to trot on the treadmill for a month. George Trelford stole a waistcoat, one month in prison. But Samuel Gillett, who stole two ice pails and a water pot, seven years transportation. The Mays brothers, Abraham and William, were notorious Barnwell thugs. They were back in court a second time in 1851 for assaulting a police officer and convicted to two years hard labour. Arson was dealt with harshly. John Newitt, aged 57, a labourer and a Chelsea pensioner, a well-dressed respectable man, had obviously got a bit tipsy and set fire to a haystack. Seven years transportation. He got off lightly. Others at the same trial, in what was obviously a rash of arson, were sent down under for 15 to 18 years. Another prisoner was Thomas Whitaker. He and his father George had been convicted of the arson of their business premises at 63 Sydney Street in 1850. Reported in detail in the contemporary press, in 1851 both were convicted to be transported for life. The women in the prison seemed to commit crimes of deceit. Mary Ann Andrews had a habit of trying to get money by means of illiterate notes. Sir, I feel myself very much 
obliged to you if you will do me a kindness to let me have the sum of ten pounds until Saturday. You will oblige me if you will. I'm yours, most obedient, Mr Thurnall Duxford. To Mr Beale's Merchant, Cambridge. After a four-hour trial, she was sent down for 12 months hard labour. Margaret Smith tried to ingratiate herself on strangers, pestering them till they gave her money. She was imprisoned for two months. Sarah Page was given six months hard labour for receiving stolen goods, sheets and napkins, property of the Reverend John Halestone of Bottisham. The National Crime Register for 1851 shows that 44 convictions were made in the courts in Cambridge, 36 men and 8 women. Most were crimes of larceny, that is, theft of personal property. Punishment for larceny varied widely, from three weeks in jail to life transportation. By 1851, most offences were punished by imprisonment or transportation. Imprisonment usually meant hard labour, and the most usual form this took was the treadmill, a pointless contraption designed to stop prisoners sitting around unoccupied. Transportation of criminals, mostly for petty offences, from the UK to Australia, had started in the 18th century and peaked in the 1830s. Records of those actually transported shows that 13 men convicted of transportation in Cambridge in 1851 arrived in Australia. Ten on the charge of theft, three for arson. The delay in being transported after conviction was sometimes several years. All men at this time were transported to Western Australia. Until 1850, the colonists of Western Australia had resisted the British government's offer of convicts. When they did start to arrive, they were used for construction projects, such as Perth Town Hall. Only one woman was transported at this time. This was Sarah Hamilton, aged 25, convicted of receiving a stolen watch and the theft of three pieces of cloth. She was sent to Tasmania for seven years, along with 200 other women, and probably worked at first in one of the female factories. We know that she applied in 1884 for 30 acres of land. The most celebrated convict from Cambridge was John Frederick Mortlock. Unlike most convicts who ended up staying in Australia, and about whom we know little, John Mortlock not only returned to England, but was transported and returned twice over. He spent all of his adult life obsessed with his ill-founded claim on the Mortlock family bank on Pease Hill in Cambridge. He was transported for 21 years in 1843, having been found guilty of the shooting of his uncle, a fellow of Christ College. He wrote his own memoirs in several instalments, and there are other fascinating accounts of his time in Australia, as well as his bizarre exploits in Cambridge. For more information about the places and people mentioned in this presentation, as well as other aspects of crime, punishment and policing in Cambridge, visit capturingcambridge.org.